Hi, I'm Sarah Soller, and I'm an author that lives here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So far, I've written three books. The first one was 100 Things You Don't Know About Nova Scotia. The second one was 100 Things You Don't Know About Atlantic Canada for Kids. And the third, is Be Prepared, The Frankie McDonald Guide to Life, the Weather, and Everything. I also work as the publicist for a graphic novel company based in Wolfville called Conundrum Press. And with Conundrum, I get to work with graphic novels. So although I've been through the process of making my own books with a publisher, Nimbus Publishing, I also get to help make other people's books to a certain extent. Um, mainly I do the part where we market them at the end, but I do at certain points weigh in on things like covers and back cover copy and things like that. Um, so I'm coming to you today talking about the two sides, from a publishing side and also from an author side. So today I'm going to take you through the process of the making of a book. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how this particular book was made. And then at the end, I'm going to teach you how to make a book of your own. But before I do that, I also want to introduce you to Fat Pony, who is my writing mascot and sits in my office and keeps me company. And also, he's pretty cute. So people real, don't realize that there's actually a lot more to the making of a book um, than you think of right off the bat. Um, people think an author writes, writes the story, thinks this is great, sends it to a publisher, and within a couple of months, bam, you've got a book. But that's not actually how it works. There's actually a lot more to it. Um, sometimes there can be up to three years, four years, even five years in the making of a book. Um, so it all starts with an idea, of course. So the artist or the author um, has to come up with an idea first and then develop that idea. They come up with the characters, they come up with the setting, all of those types of things, if you're writing fiction. If you're writing nonfiction, you need to do the initial research and figure out exactly what you want to talk about. You need to figure out the format you're going to write it in. Um, and you want to figure out um, what ultimately you want to, your readers to understand. After that, the process is a little bit different depending on if you're writing fiction or nonfiction. So if you're writing fiction, you need to have your whole book written before you send that to the publisher. Um, so you start out, of course, by writing your first draft. Um, then once you're happy with your first draft, I like to think, by the way, of writing a first draft as putting all your sand in a sandbox. So it's putting all your words on the paper. Um, you basically, you're building up the tools that you need to keep writing after that. So once you get your first draft, then you start the revision process. So at that point, you go through everything that you've already written and you clean it up and you take things out and maybe you add some new things and then maybe you take out whole chapters or you cut out a character or you give somebody, you know, you throw in a new villain. Um, you can do all kinds of things when you're revising and you are in no way stuck to that initial first draft. So after your first draft, you revise and then you revise again, and then you revise again, and you revise, and you revise, and you revise. Okay, and once you're done all of those revisions, and it's as clean as you can possibly make it, you send it to the publisher. And you also include a letter that's called a query letter. And in that letter, you say who you are, you talk about, you give them the elevator pitch, which is a very short description of what your book is and what it's about. You explain things like why you're the right person to tell the story you're telling. And you explain why you think that this book should be published. Basically, you have to convince the publisher that your book is worth putting their money into um, and, and partnering with you on. So hopefully you'll get a contract but often you'll get a rejection letter and that's par for the course and totally normal and we all get them. Um, and then you just try another publisher and you try another publisher um, and you keep going until you find the right person to publish your book, the right editor who sees the promise in your work and wants to go in on that project with you. Um, so when that happens, you get a book deal. And so what that is, it's an agreement that the publisher sends you that says, 
Um, these are the terms. We will publish this book with you. This, this is what we'll pay you, and this is generally when we'll aim to publish this. And, and it has a lot of terms like that. It could get very boring if I keep going on. So after that, um, the hard work starts again, because at that point, the editor at the publisher gives your book a read and picks out all the things that you need to revise again. <laughs> so they'll send you an email with all the things you need to revise and you go back into the cycle of revising and revising and revising and revising and then you'll send it back to the editor and they'll probably send you another round of edits asking you to revise more things and you'll do that. And the cycle continues until the editor says this is great it's as good as it's ever going to get. Let's do this thing. And you start the production process. That's the fun part for the author because all your hard work is done at this point. And that's when you get to start really seeing your work become a real book. The editor sends it to um, the production team. Usually there's a graphic designer on that team and they lay your book out. They pick fonts for it. Um, they put pictures wherever those need to go. And, um, and once that's done, they send it back to you for, to review. And then you read through it and you find all the typos and anything that needs to be changed. Um, and let in, then you let them know about that. After that, um, they fix up all the little things that you caught. They send you another version of that back. You look at it, hopefully it's perfect. And you give them the okay. From there, you get a cover which is for me the most, I love seeing a uh, cover. And, um, and hopefully it's, it's what you were hoping for and some publishers will let you have a little bit of say, some won't. It's just, it varies depending on the publisher. Um, and from then on it goes to print and then it goes to stores and your book is born. Over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the same things, but I wanna show you the actual pieces of how 100 Things You Don't Know About Atlantic Canada for Kids came together. Remember how I said that you started with a query letter? Um, one thing I didn't mention is that with nonfiction, it works slightly differently. So instead of having written the whole thing up front, you really just have to have an idea and you have to have some samples to send along. Sometimes you also need to have a table of contents. Um, that's not something that I had to do for these, but some nonfiction authors do. So what you're going to see right now is a breakdown of how a nonfiction book comes together. So I started out with a proposal letter, which is really more of a description for a nonfiction book, whereas the query letter is for fiction. It says, hi Whitney, I'm writing to you to for formally propose a nonfiction middle grade book titled 100 Things You Don't Know About Atlantic Canada for kids. Like 100 Things You Don't Know About Nova Scotia, it would be broken up into 100 sections, each about a page long, and would include photos or illustrations. The things would be evenly split between all four Atlantic provinces and would be inspired by culture, art, people, history, achievements, etc. I'd also take care to keep the young audience in mind, tailoring the topics and content for the appropriate age level. Possible things include a small town in New Brunswick calls itself the French fry capital of the world. A boy found a 304 million year old fossil while visiting Prince Edward Island. Ganong Brothers Limited in St. Stephen is the first in Canada to produce lollipops. And in the 1900s, mining companies in Newfoundland hired 10 year olds. So there were a number of other things that I say here on the list. They were just things that I started out with that I thought I could expand into this book. Um, and then I added a note saying, I haven't included Nova Scotia in this list because you already have a good idea of the types of things I'd use from here because I had already written that one at this point and Whitney was well familiar with that book. Each section would ha also have an info box with a suggestion for a related activity. For example, a visit to a specific museum, an annual event, something kids could do with their parents like rock collecting at Fundy or geocaching. My primary goal is to create a book that kids will want to pick up on their own and read bits and pieces at a time. But while writing and choosing activities, I'll also consider the needs and interests of teachers and parents. By releasing this book within the next two years, I think there's real potential to build on the expected success of 100 things you don't know about Nova Scotia. I've also attached a sample thing. Please let me know if you have any questions or if you need anything else. Sarah. 
So that's what I sent off to Whitney. Now this is um, a letter that I sent to somebody I already knew. So it's a little bit less formal than it would be if I was sending it to a publisher I didn't know. Um, but that gives you an idea of the kind of information that you need to include when you send off a letter to a publisher. So then the sample thing was an expansion of the bullet point about how lollipops were first made in St. Stephen, New Brunswick in 1895. So what I've done is I have the sample here that I sent to Whitney um, and I also have a couple other versions of that same, same section of the book. So you can see here, I'll, I'll read you the original and then I'll show you the differences that happened as, we, as the process went along. So it started out with, the first lollipops were made in St. Stephen, New Brunswick in 1895, and that's the header. In St. Stephen, New Brunswick, there's a candy making company with a long inventive history. When two brothers, James and Gilbert Ganong, first founded Ganong Brothers Limited in 1873, it mainly sold groceries, but before long, Gilbert noticed they were making most of their money by selling cakes, oysters, and you guessed it, candy. At first, the candy they sold came from St. John, and then the U.S., but eventually they started making their own, and that's when things really took off. In 1885, one of their candy makers invented chicken bones, long pink hard candies with chocolate in the middle. Four years later, they installed a candy making machine that could make thousands of hard candies every day. And in 1895, Ganong started making all day suckers. They were available in a bunch of flavors, including orange, strawberry, peppermint, and licorice. And instead of the papery sticks we have today, the candy had wooden butcher skewers in the middle of them. But of course, Ganong Brothers didn't stop there. They kept making candy news by making the first chocolate nut bar in North America in 1910 and becoming the first Canadian candy maker to sell chocolates in heart-shaped boxes in 1930. And then I have another section, the info box that I mentioned in my letter to Whitney. And it's titled Fun Stuff, and it says, Want to see the Ganong Brothers in action? Visit the Chocolate Museum in St. Stephen and explore the original Ganong factory, check out candy exhibits, and find out how chocolates are made. And then it has a link so people can go find out for themselves. So that's what I originally sent to the publisher. So that's also really my first draft of that section. So then what happened is I got Whitney, of course, she actually gave that to a different editor um, to, who went through and made her corrections. And so she sent me this. You probably can't see it, but um, you can see how she highlighted things and then deleted things. And then she made comments here. She says, there's lots of really colorful posters online, but I didn't see anything locally available. It would be a fun addition, though. So that was on another one. I just wanted you to be able to see a comment. Um, but this is the one about how Harry Houdini escaped from a cell in Halifax City Hall in 1896. So you can see she makes corrections. She adds comments on things that I can add more information on. Um, if she thinks that there's a, a photo that needs to be added, sometimes comments are made about those types of things. So what happens is I get this, this draft back with all these comments and I go through it all and I incorporate those, I think about those things, I think about which ones I agree with, which ones I want to incorporate, um, and then I send it back. So this is a copy of the PDF that they sent me before it went to print. Um, this is basically the version that they asked me to have a look through and make sure I don't see any last errors. Um, so I printed that off, it basically looks the same as it did in the final book. Um, so, of course, here's the book with the cover. It's got, a, it's got back cover copy describing the book. It has my author photo and my biography, um, the Nimbus Publishing logo. And uh, let's see. So then I will take you to number 36. And there's the final version. And it's pretty much the same as this. Actually, I don't think there were any changes to that section. But yeah, so you can see how this, this was just a PDF, and this is what ended up happening when they put it in a published book. I actually really love books with pictures. Um, so graphic novels, picture books, whether they're for grown-ups or kids, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm a big fan of the visual arts, and I'm a big fan of books, so when they get blended together, that's kind of my happy place. Um, so because of that, I want to teach you how to make zines. So it's really easy to do, um, and you can make it without even using tape. Um, you can just make this little eight-page 
zine here, and I'm going to start by showing you how to do that. So you start with just a regular old piece of paper. So it could be a piece of construction paper, it could be from your printer like this one is. And then what you have to do is you fold it in half. And probably mine's going to end up crooked because that's what always happens to me. So then you fold it in half. So you've got it's folded in half like, like a book. And then you fold it in half again, edge to edge. Okay, so now you've got it folded once all the way across lengthwise, and then you've got it folded lengthwise again. Then you fold it across end to end. Okay, so now you open it up, but just once. So you open it up like this. So it starts out like this, open it, open it, but leave that first fold there. So it's still folded once, leave that there. But you have all these lines, see? So you have this and this. Find that corner that's not, that's still closed, that's not open. So this is the open side. This is the folded part. Take your scissors, which I kindly borrowed from the Writers Federation of Nova Scotia. Thank you, shout out. <laughs> so you find this line right here, you wanna cut. So this is the closed end. So you wanna cut along here, but only to the middle. So it's flopping open there. Okay, so now you've got it folded. So you open it up and you open it up again. And you've got this interesting little, hey, it's like a mouth. Hello. Okay, anyways, so you open it up. I don't know if you can see, but this is this is the tricky part because what you do is you close it like this and then you've got, you can fold it. So see, you can do this and then you fold it like this and it becomes a book. So you've got eight pages and then you close it. So you don't need staples or anything, it's just it folds into itself. And if you didn't quite get a clear vision from me as to how to do it, there's also probably YouTube videos on how to do that that show it much better than I did. <laughs> All right, so once you have your zine folded, that's when you decide what you wanna make. Okay, so when you make a zine, um, it's basically a tiny book. Uh, it's short for fanzine actually, and I think it was invented in the 80s or not, 80s. I believe they first started making them. Um, and at the time it was built a lot on photocopiers. So it was actually a really great way to make something and then you can photocopy it and fold them all back up like I did. And then you have multiple copies of something that you can trade with your friends or you can, you know, a lot of people still make zines and sell them at comic festivals and things like that. Um, they might not necessarily use this method, um, often they'll just get a lot of pages together, fold them and staple them, or they'll just get a print press to, to produce them for them. Um, but anyways, that's a little bit of the, the details around zine making. Let's, I'll start by drawing a picture. Maybe I can draw a picture of my fat pony here. Let's see. We have my, my fat pony picture. <laughs> So you can draw your own pictures. You can <laughs> glue on pictures that you've cut out. I, right. I'm gonna start with this bird, parakeet wearing sunglasses. You can, <laughs> so you can also get stamps, any other things. Sometimes people print out um, things, you can print things out from the internet and glue them on. And then you end up with a book. So I'm just gonna leave it here, but zine making zine. It's not really about zine making, it's really about that pony and also this bird with sunglasses on. But you get the point. So you can fill up all these pages with whatever you want. It can be a topic, it can just be like different kinds of art that you've wanted to draw, or maybe it's a whole collage, set of collages, or maybe it's just like a mix of all the things. You could even put in things that you find outside, like maybe you find a leaf that you like. You could make a little book with like a leaf collection inside or you can press flowers and, and put them inside. You can do, the cool thing with zines is you can do literally whatever you want with them because that's the whole point of zine making.
So I hope that this session has inspired you to make your own art and make your own books. And um, I hope that you start making zines of your own and filling them up with whatever things make you happy. If you have a favorite book, go ahead and make a fanzine about it. If you have a favorite movie, make a fanzine about that. If you have a favorite breakfast cereal, you can go ahead <laughs> and you can make a zine about it. The sky is the limit. And I hope that you take advantage of that. Um, remember to share your zines with your friends and support your friends' artwork too. And remember that you can get inspiration anywhere and always read whatever books make you happy.